right now very happy and excited to welcome back into the show, first time on my new show, right here in studio, Reza Aslan, religious scholar, author of amazing books like No God But God, Zealot, and now a brand new book out today on Election Day, God, a human story. Reza, great a to see you. Human history. Human yeah. history. Why do I keep saying this? I don't know, but it's a good story, though. It is. A human, <laughs> a human history. You're really big in the whole God thing. This is you. You're a big... Yeah, you know, God, God has been very good to me, you know? Le uh, by the way, Wolf Blitzer does not sleep. He does he not. He's not actually a person. He, he's he's a, a robotic. He's a I would think so. He's actually, yeah, he's a hologram. I have no doubt because there's some. He's not aged in like twenty. He's not aged. He's on TV like nineteen hours a day. Um, so yeah, just. I, Let me ask you. You know, you know a lot about God. Why has God forsaken us and given us trouble? <laughs> you really know, I actually us? asked God that question today. What did God say? Uh, I had a I had a Twitter interview with uh, with the tweet of God. You know, right, God, I saw that. God's Twitter. Yeah, yeah. God is on Twitter. Um, and I just flat out said, like, what did we do, O oh Lord, to deserve this? And and how? How can we right. appease your your anger? Uh, so you sacrifice know, what, involved yeah, or like something? Why? Why Trump? And he just gave me the shrug emoji. <gasps> God! Shrug! <laughs> look, so he, yeah, what I'm saying is, even God is like, I don't know. Well, I don't know. The, I don't look, know how to explain this. This is like Old Testament stuff happening. It's the Old Trump Testament. here. This is locust and famine and really? everything. So, do you, you've studied a lot of religions. Like, you've been to CNN show. Yeah, you've been yeah. out there. Is there a chance Donald Trump is possessed by a demon? Is there any chance? Or could he be some manifestation of a demonic presence of some kind? Well, you know, I, I, just, I just had an op-ed come out today in the LA Times basically saying that... Um, He's a cult leader. Right. He's a, he's a, you know, he started a religious cult. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, look, this is a guy who's, I mean, I would say like the emotion that most perfectly describes Donald Trump is negative empathy, right? He, he takes delight in other people's suffering. Right. Um, you know, and, and it's just, it's incredible the, the way in which he has been able to pull the wool over the eyes, especially of, you know, white evangelicals. I mean, I think you and I have talked about this. 81% yeah. of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump. That's more white evangelicals than voted for George W. Bush, who was a white evangelical. <laughs> um, and to this day, you know, today, uh, the newest polls came out today. He's the lowest uh, approval rating of any president in modern history. And yet... His highest approval comes from white evangelicals. Seventy-five percent of white evangelicals continue to strongly support him, and even more interesting, among that seventy-five percent, uh, support for him is highest among those who go to church at least once a week. So, in other words, the more religious you are, the more likely, if you're a white evangelical, right, to support Donald Trump. Any theory from a theological point of view why this is happening? Yeah. Why would they? <laughs> yeah. why they Besides the fact that he's that he's basically created his own cult. Well, look, there's actually a couple of very important points here, mm -hmm. and I think this is this is a serious conversation sure. because it's baffling. It doesn't make any sense, I agree. right? Um, I mean, this is a man, after all, whose entire worldview makes a mockery of Christianity and Christian values. You know, this is a man who's not only thrice married, not only a greedy, lecherous, you know. Uh, human being, but uh, also somebody who has like no religious, you know, credentials whatsoever. Can't even men can't even like name a single Bible verse, right? No, they're right. like, name us a verse, give us any verse, and he's like, I like them all. <laughs> uh, why should I choose which one is the? It's all good. Know, like a smorgasbord. Like, give me anyone. Like, just Jesus wept. Just say that. Right. That's enough. Right. Um, but the the first and most important thing to keep in mind when trying to understand this is that it was eighty one percent of white evangelicals. We can't forget the white part. 67% of evangelicals of color supported Hillary Clinton. So these are people who have the same exact theological views, but just a different skin tone. So let's not pretend that race doesn't have anything to do with this. This is about race. Okay. So first of all, it's a racial thing. Second of all, you know, I've, I think you and I have even talked about this before, the sort of the pernicious influence of the prosperity gospel on America. We have. I've never used the word pernicious in my life, but yes, you use right? the word prosperity. prosperity yes. Those of you unfamiliar with the prosperity gospel, this is that sort of, uh, you know, nonsense preached by people like 
Joel Osteen and T.D. Jakes about how what God really wants from you is material wealth, like just a big house, a nice car. And That's what Jesus died and for. And close your church when there's a hurricane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what Jesus wants. And those dirty, dirty people fleeing a hurricane. Right. Um, and that has so taken root in American evangelicalism, particularly white evangelicalism, that for a large swath of white evangelicals, they just saw Donald Trump's wealth and interpreted that as God's blessings. And so it kept Donald Trump from having to do what every other Republican candidate for president has had to do, which is to actually prove his spiritual bona fides, right? Donald Trump didn't have to prove that he was Christian, you know, by, for instance, naming a single Bible verse. Right. Uh, all he had to do was say, I'm rich, and that was enough, you know? Um, and then I think also another point that's important is that for, you know, the really the first time, you know, I, that I've been paying attention, you know, Donald Trump was a, was a candidate who just explicitly promised secular power to evangelicals, right? I mean, there's this very famous closed door meeting that the audio got leaked when he was talking to Falwell and Dobson and Robertson and all those, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Assholes. Um, <laughs> and he said, uh, he's like, I'm going to give you your power back. That, you know, this idea that, you know, the, the pet causes that you have, whether they're my cause or not, I will give it to you. This sort of explicit promise mm -hmm. of, of delivering secular power, which, by the way, he's already begun doing. And, you know, he's having... He's spoken repeatedly about ri getting rid of the so-called Johnson Amendment, sure. right? Which right. Uh, which prohibits you know pastors from preaching politics from the pulpit. I mean, there are some very complex tax reasons why that is not okay, and Trump uh, has promised to get rid of that that view. So, all of those things are important, but honestly, none of that explains this one fundamental fact, which is that in the span of a single election cycle, white evangelicals in this country have gone from being the group in America most likely to say that a politician's public morality matters to the group least likely to say that. In other words, atheists in America say in larger numbers that a politician's morality matters than white evangelicals who call themselves value voters. And the only explanation for that is that Trump has transformed a large part of American evangelical Christianity into his own personal cult.